All right. So let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Office Hours live stream. Um, today, we're going to talk about component properties. And some of the things we're going to talk about today is you know, when to consider using them in place of variants, um, when to use them with variants. Um, we're also going to talk about some tips and discussion around creating and editing components. So with that, um, I'm Chad. I'm a designer advocate on the team here at Figma, and it is great to uh, meet everyone here today. I'm also joined on the live stream by Naomi and Jacob. And you know, Naomi, Jacob, would you like to say hello and introduce yourselves? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi. I am a software engineer here at Figma, um, and I've been working on design systems features. Um, in particular, I've worked on variants, and I also um, was a big part in building component properties. What is up, everyone? I am Jacob. I am the PM over here for the, all the design systems these features. And so I was running the stream for component properties. Super excited to share it with all of you today. Awesome. Now, whether you've been with us before or this is your first time joining us for a live stream, you know we are excited that you're here today. And we just wanna make sure we go over some housekeeping before we dive in. Probably the number one question we get on component properties and live streams as a whole is, will this be recorded? Absolutely, yes, this session will be recorded and it will be available on the Figma YouTube channel, um, likely sometime next week. Um, also, you know, we are definitely going to reserve some time for your questions at the end. So um, use the Q&A button in Zoom if you have questions and uh, we will um, select some to address at the end. Um, if you are gonna use the chat, um, please be sure to set that to everyone. Um, we ask of course though, most importantly that it's, you know, be kind. Figma does have a code of conduct. Um, so please be respectful of everyone that we have on the virtual stage and everyone here in the live stream chat today. All right, so with that, let's jump right into it and see what we're going to cover. As I mentioned, we're going to start out, we're gonna give a little bit of an overview on component props, or uh, if you caught uh, Miggy at config, you know, props as we like to call it, um, we're gonna give a little props overview and demo. We're gonna have a bit of a discussion on the feature and then of course, open it up um, and address some of your questions. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Naomi who is going to talk a little bit about props and variants. Cool. Um, so basically component props are built off of variants. Um, both of these features basically make it um, easier to make your design systems more powerful, um, in particular, sort of like add customiza customization to components. Um, so before we dive into component props, we wanted to give a quick overview on variants so that we can sort of build up the context on onto which like how component props can be best to use um, to suit your design system. So um, essentially variants let you take individual components and combine them into like a single set so this can help components be easier to find in the assets panel. They're a little easier to use because there's um, a specific UI when you are using instances of a component set that allows you to navigate between them. Um, there's just like improved discovery of the different variations and they're also more aligned with code than an individual component can be. So if we take this example, you could see that there's um, four different individual button components, but they'd be more powerful as a component set where you sort of have four different variants of a single button that sort of represent like different states like hover or focus. Um, but, um, you know, we can imagine a situation where you want to add sort of different types of properties within your variant. Um, and this could create um, growing complexity within your component set. So for example, we had um, the variants um, with different states from the last example with like a default state, a hover state, a focus state, but perhaps we also wanna add a type for our button component. So maybe there's like a primary type, a secondary type, um, and types for the buttons with icons versus not. 
Um, so here we sort of show an example of a component set with two properties and um, already we're starting to see like a growing um, level of complexity with a number of different variants that we have to draw out. Um, this can start to expand even more as you want to be able to add more variant props um, and sort of becomes difficult to maintain when you have a set with like so many of these variant components inside. Um, so that sort of sets up the context for why we wanted to build component props. Um, essentially, component props um, now as help you assign names and values to specific layers um, that can be customized in a component. Um, in particular, we built component props for visibility, um, for text, and for instance swaps. So here you can see that you can add a visibility prop to this heart layer um, and the heart will either be shown or not shown. Um, and so we can toggle that at the top level of the instance. Um, in the middle, we have an example of a text property where you can um, override the text directly from the design panel or the properties panel on the right side. Um, and, and lastly, we also have a instance swap property. So if this part is maybe like an icon instance, um, you can specifically assign a instance swap property that can um, swap it to different icons um, within your component library. So maybe like this cancel icon or this lock icon. Um, and basically you can add these properties to different layers within your component. Um, and you can combine all these different types of properties to build a robust component. Um, and so there are a few benefits um, of using component props. Um, it will reduce the number of different configurations that you need to draw out um, with variants. Um, there's a little bit of an easier discovery of which parts of the components can be customized. So if you have consumers of your de design system using instances, um, all of these properties will be shown at the top level. So um, your consumers don't have to sort of drill down into specific layers to change their visibility or their text, um, et cetera. And there's a little bit better alignment between design and code um, in comparison to what we had with variants. Um, so going a little bit deeper into those, um, one, we're able to reduce the number of variants. Um, so, you know, in the old world where we only supported variants, you could imagine that if you wanted to have um, a button with maybe two different types and also um, have a property to determine whether or not the icon is shown, um, you'd have to draw out like all four of these. Um, but once we use props, we could instead apply a visibility prop to the heart icon. And so you can reduce the number of variants to only have um, these two variants. And so now you're using both variant props and component props um, on this component set. Um, one thing that's worth noting um, is that this also helps improve the memory and performance for your files, um, including files that are just using like a single instance of your component set. And this is because under the hood, um, we basically have to import the entire um, variant set when you're using like a single um, variant instance. Um, and we do this under the hood so that um, your variant swaps can work offline um, when you're not connected to the internet, for example. Um, and so under the hood, what we do is we would actually import all four of these variants if you were to just be using one of them. Um, and so by reducing the size of your variant, you are actually going to be reducing the number of layers that you need to import when using um, an instance. And so that's another benefit of um, component props, um, which is related to being able to reduce the amount of variants that you have in your variant set. Um, another benefit that I mentioned earlier was better alignment with code. So um, component properties allow you to set up your components with the same attributes that you might have in a React component that your web developers are building. So in this example, um, you might build a component with um, an icon property or an instance swap property um, and a text property. And those can um, be one-to-one -one sort of like um, translated into properties on uh, React components. Um, so this alignment makes it easier to update and maintain, maintain consistency between your design system and your code base. Um, cool. So we've gotten a few questions around like, what are the best times to be using variants versus when to be using component properties? Um, so we kind of outlined a few different use cases for variants versus props. Um, 
I would generally say that variants have a specific use case. And so um, in these few use cases here, um, you'd want to be using variants. And then if these use cases don't apply, that's when you want to be using component pops. Um, so that's kind of one way to think about it. So um, these use cases where variants are best suited for include interactive states. So um, in order to, be, to use Figma's interactive component feature, you do have to build and draw out the individual variants that you want to be able to um, interact, like add interactivity to. So if you have like a hover state, um, or if you want to have a click to interaction, you want to um, build that into a variant set, um, like this example here with the label button. Um, and then another great use case for variants is when you have like style differences um, or layout changes. So here we see that um, these different banner variants all have sort of like slightly different styles. Um, and with this um, sizing example and these layout changes, um, you do really get an advantage um, by drawing those variants out. Um, and since component props really only control a single layer, it can't really um, um, have like the same power to them as variants do when you're thinking about like what the component or the instance actually looks like in terms of its layout. Um, and then finally, another, another use case for variants is if you want to be able to control sort of like, um, like different configurations. So with props, um, if you have like maybe an icon and you don't want a different thing to be shown at the same time as that, um, you might have like a specific configuration that is allowed and a configuration that isn't allowed. And so variance sort of like gives you that type of control that component props cannot because component props are again, tied to like specific layers. And so those layers um, will consume those properties and you can't really add sort of um, conditional logic within props um, in the same way that you can with variance. Um, so now that I've talked through some of the use cases for variance, um, that kind of leaves when um, should you be using props? And so props um, are best used for the different types of properties that we have introduced with this feature. So visibility, instance swap, and text content. Um, really, this will one, like reduce the number of variants that you have if you are going to be applying these props across multiple of your variants. Um, so that's really um, a big advantage and one of the reasons why you want to be using props when you can. Um, and in addition, if you want to be able to control like these properties at the top level of your instance, you want to add properties so that um, you can really be able to use them on your instances. Um, but ultimately, we generally recommend that you are able to use component props and variants together because um, that will really unlock like the, the ultimate power of these features together. Um, so you want to think about, you know, like where are like different layers that are um, being shown or not shown across like the different variants that I have. Um, similar with like text and instance swaps, like if you have um, similar layouts within your different variants that want to be controlled in um, similar ways, um, this is really a great way to sort of like use these properties together. Um, and Chad and Jacob are going to be doing demos um, that will really sort of show different examples of when um, we might want to be using component props and when we want to use variants and how to use them together. Um, so yeah, with that, I will pass it off to Jacob, who will be doing um, a demo of like how to actually go ahead and create these properties. What is up, everyone? Let's jump into how to just go ahead and create a simple component property equip button. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now, and we're just going to walk through the simple way to go ahead and create a button component inside of Figma using component properties. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop some text on here, say button. Next, I'm going to use my handy little hotkey shift A, which will create an auto layout frame around this button. And next, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and click the create component button over here to just make a simple component. One thing to note as well is we can also create a variant up here, remove that button up this way. So if you're looking for that, uh, how to create variants now, that's one way to do it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and style this a little bit more. Maybe give it a fill in here of blue. We'll make it a blue button. Why not? And then I'll name this just to be consistent with things. And now we've got a handy dandy little button right here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and create the simplest prop on this first which is just creating a text component. 
oh, hey, I've got Naomi in here too. She's going to be helping me later on uh, showing some code examples of the components that I'm creating. All right, I'm going to click on my text layer over here. And what we can see right now is that there is this content field inside of this text layer. And what I can do is I can bind a property to this content field. And I can do that one of two ways. Either I can go ahead and create a property directly from this layer, or what I can do is I can select the parent component itself, go to my properties drop down over here, create this. I'm going to create a text uh, property right now. I'm just going to name this label. And I'll have the value be button with like an exclamation mark right there. Yeah. All right. Now notice right now, since I created this at the top level, it did not bind to that layer immediately. And in fact, what we see over here is that there's this little alert that says not used within this component. That is because if I'm creating these from the top down, they don't bind to the layers automatically. I have to bind them after the fact. So I'm gonna click on my text layer again, go back over towards my content field, and then I'm gonna click this. And we can see that label is there as a property they can use on this content field. So I go ahead and click that. And one thing we see here immediately is that this button updates its text to button with the exclamation mark, since that is the value of this property over here. When I create an instance of it, you can see that we have the label over here and the actual value of that property. And if I change this, we can see that that updates on Canvas. So that is using a simple text property in a button. All right, let's go a little bit further. I'm gonna show you the two other properties that we support, which are instance properties and Boolean properties. So I'm gonna go and search for an icon. Oh, I already have, nice. And I'm gonna go ahead and add, uh, why not? We'll make this an image button. I'm just gonna resize this a little bit to make it a little bit smaller so that it fits into here nicely. Do, 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 do. Perfect, we got a little button there. And what I'm gonna do first is inside of this instance, I'm gonna go bottoms up and bind in a Boolean property to the visibility of this layer. And so normally we would toggle this visibility over here by turning this on and off. And we can see with auto layout present that button will automatically resize itself. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click over here and create a Boolean property that applies to the visibility of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this. I'm gonna name this icon viz with the value set to true initially. And since it is set to true initially, notice that nothing changes in this button. But when I go ahead and create a copy of this over here, I now have this icon viz Boolean property that is attached to the visibility of that layer. So now I can click that on and off and I can see the presence of that icon hide and show. All right, but now what if I want to go ahead and change that icon to something else? Well, normally I would go in here and use this to actually swap it out to a different icon, but I can use the power of component properties to help me out with that. So instead of what if, uh, going to this drop down, I'm gonna go over here to our little in, uh, instant swap property icon. And I wanna go ahead and create just an icon prop for this. And we'll have the default value be set to image. Now, when I create an instance of this button, we see a few different things inside of here. First is our text property. The next is our Boolean visibility. And one interesting thing is notice that when I hide that Boolean visibility, that icon prop goes away. But I can also go ahead and swap to different icons from this little drop down here at the top level. So it makes the control of these buttons so much easier when we actually have that direct control there, but we also have a little bit better of alignment with code. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you the old way of creating out a variant set. And we're gonna see the code representation that Naomi's gonna help out with. And then we're gonna look at this button again and see how it differs from the props implementation. So first things first, I'm gonna go ahead and just create a new component set out of this button over here. And I'm gonna go and add a variant, creating from the top. And I'm gonna name the property that I created for the variant to just be icon position. And in the first case, I usually want my default button here to have no icon. 
So what I'm going to say here is that for this icon position, this is just going to be set to none. For this one over here, the icon position is going to be before. And I'm going to create a couple more variants here as well. And for this one over here, we're going to say this icon position is after. And we're going to do one more of these. And what I'm going to say with this one is that there is an icon both before and there is an icon after on this. So we'll say before and after. Now, from a code representation standpoint, this feels a little bit weird. At least for me personally, having this button props where we have this icon position here and we have these enums of none before, after, before, and after feels kind of weird from an implementation standpoint. At least for me, I would expect most buttons that you create out there to have separate icon before and icon after attributes that you pass in the actual button itself or the icon itself into that attribute. So let's look at how we would do things in the props world instead. Notice over here that I have different properties that are present, things like label, icon viz, and icon. Now to match what we have over here, I'm going to rename some of these so that we can support both an icon before and an icon after. So I'm going to go here and rename this to icon before viz. And this one will be icon before. And in addition to that as well, I'm going to add in another icon over here. I'm going to remove the bindings for these props. And I'm going to create a icon after and an icon after this. Now, this feels much more aligned with how I would do things in code by actually mapping in the different strings that we would pass in for these icons to the button itself. It gives me a lot more control with actually changing how this button is represented. And it aligns with more how people would do things in the code world. But let's look at an even more complex example as well. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to build out a modal that consumes this button. And we can see how that we would actually represent that modal in React as well. Let's go and draw a modal from scratch. I'm going to go and get fancy with this. I'll add some roundedness to it. I'm going to create an effect because why not? And then I'm going to drop in, first and foremost, a title to this modal. Hello, modal. I'm going to make that text a little bit bigger to make it seem like a proper title. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and create a component out of this. And then I'm going to bind a property to my text field over here. So I'm going to go over to my content field along the right. I'm going to click this. And I'm going to name this title. And we'll say hello modal is the value of this. And here we can see really some of the power of props. This really matches with how we would represent something in React by saying that this is an interface that has a title of string, and we can modify that by using the attributes of this modal. Next, we would probably want something like a content area inside of here, some sort of slot type deal. I won't go how to represent that right now. Let's just pretend that there's some content over here. The last thing, though, is that I'm going to have a button over here in my modal. And what I'm going to say for this modal is that this button represents some sort of action. So I'm going to go over here where I have this button instance, and I'm going to create a property over here named action. And this will represent the instance of the button that is there. And so now what we can see is that with this modal, we have something that would allow us to properly represent something on the code side. And we can see the easy use of that inside of our uh, Figma file itself in a way that feels like it matches code. We can pass in various instances as props. 
and we can modify things like the title of this directly inside of the sidebar over here. All right, so that's what we got for a quick little demo here. Chad is now gonna walk us through how to go and modify a larger variant set that's out there and equip it with props and use both of those together to create a much better, more robust component. Awesome, thank you, Jacob. So, you know, really great for when you are getting started and creating new components. Um, you know, but of course we know that a lot of folks have existing libraries out there. So, um, you know, of course, when we look at our libraries and we just have a couple of components as an example here. Now, when we just quickly look, it's like, yeah, we could apply props to all of these components. But I think one thing that's really important to ask yourselves that if you are a maintainer of your libraries is, should I apply props to everything? Um, and that's really where, as Naomi highlighted in the beginning, you know, there's times and places where you know variants still make sense, and there's places where props can make sense. Um, for example, if I look at some of these, like in our buttons, I can clearly see that you know I could use the Boolean props to handle the icons, similar to what Jacob demoed. Um, I could use content props on here and instance swap. But if I take a look at some other components here, like our checkbox, I could probably consolidate these a bit. But when I look at it, you know, the indeterminate and the way it's set up, you know, maybe I really don't. You know, variants make sense here because these are stylistic changes. Um, so maybe if I'm diving in, you know, I'm going to zoom in here, and we can see that. Um, one thing is the on canvas control now to select all matching layers within the component set. So, you know, maybe the only change I want to use here to add some props to this checkbox is just to surface the label at the top level. So I'm going to select all those layers by clicking that on canvas control. And I'm going to create a content prop and call it label. And maybe I will simplify this and just have it as option as the default. Now I can do the same thing on the radio here real quick. So I'm just being very additive with these props at the moment and making it a little bit easier for folks using them. Now we can do the same thing like notification. Our variant for this is just the size. You know, this doesn't make sense to use a prop on that, but again, we could simplify and we could create a content prop for the count. Um, and again, of course, making sure you're looking at, you know, what these properties or variant names are on the code side of things. Um, I'm going to skip some of the others here and we'll come back over here. Now, with the button, we know that there is some refactoring we can do here to really simplify this component set. Now, one of the things that I really recommend is um, utilizing, um, like using your library analytics if you have that to um, really see what components are being used the most, um, or just, you know, if you are talking with your teams or, you know, you have a good idea of how your libraries are being used and which components are used the most, those are typically the ones that you're going to want to set up all of your, um, your kind of main button that contains everything, um, just because it's already in use the most in different files. So for example, um, we know from looking at our side of things that you know, our primary buttons without an icon or CTA are really our most commonly used ones. So what I'm going to do is create um, our primary default buttons here. I'm just going to paste in that image. And I'm going to do the same thing with the arrow. So I can just select all of these and paste it. I now have buttons that contain everything. So I could start to apply properties to them. Now, realistically, we would really do this on all of our components. Um, so I'm going to actually unhide because I've already made this change to our other buttons here. And now when you have an existing component set, personally, I find it a bit easier to use the bottom up method that Jacob demonstrated for adding your um, properties. So I'm going to select just my image here. And of course, I'm going to select all of the matching layers within this component set. And I'm going to give this a layer visibility of the 
Um, you know, we know that, let me back up here. We know that it is icon, true and false in our variant. And then we know the other thing we're gonna modify on the arrow is the behavior, if it's standard or if it's a CTA. So I'm going to dive back in here and select all of these again. And I'm going to create that layer name as icon. And it's probably false by default. So we're gonna hide that. And then I'm also going to add an instance swap property to that, which we call it use icon, for example. Now we'll do the same thing here with our arrow forward, but we're not going to apply an instance swap because it should always be just the arrow. And in consulting um, with Naomi, I found that actually it's not behavior. We call this is CTA. So I'm gonna set that to false. And the last thing I'm going to do is add a content prop to make updating this easier. So again, selecting all, and we'll call this label. And just so we can see it change, I'll change all to button. All right. So now we see we have a lot of duplication here. All of our buttons look exactly the same. So we really no longer need our, I'm just gonna select all of these ones here. And I am just going to remove those for right now. Now, as we take a look here and I select the component set, we can see I have my variants listed at the top here and I have my props at the bottom. Uh, maybe I want to rearrange this. I want the is CTA higher. So I'm going to just drag that up here. So that's my first choice after setting an active. Now, one of the things to uh, think about, of course, is now what happens to consuming files when I publish this library? Well, right now, if we publish this, we would still have that behavior and our icon variant which as we can see in the panel here, I only have one option for it now. So to really move away from the variant, I would end up deleting those properties by right clicking and selecting delete property. <clears throat> now here in the library as an example, we can see if I take an instance of this button, I now have that inactive is still a variant, my states are still handled by variants. But now I can do the is CTA to show the arrow. I can select icon and then I can choose a different icon to put in place of it. So everything's working as intended here. But now if I go into a file where or a page here where I'm using the button. Now, one thing we're going to see. So if I had published that library out and this was a consuming file here, we can see that that primary button, which is what we said we know is used the most. It's received its updates and it has those component props on there and I can edit right over on the side panel here. Now, one other thing I wanna show here, I'm gonna come back into the library. Let's say I'm also going to update this. Maybe we're gonna adjust it so we only have eight pixels of padding. Now, we see here that these instances did not get updated, whereas the primary did. And what we find here is if I select an instance that's no longer in use, um, it's not going to reset the design on it. So it's just going to say that I have a missing variant and I should reset it to default in order to um, apply all, the, all of the component props. So similar to on the code side of things where, you know, sometimes there are major upgrades and there can be a breaking change, you know, migrating to props, depending on how your libraries are structured and your assets are used, you know, there is potential for breaking changes. Um, one of the things is we want to make sure that we're not just resetting everyone's files though. So um, if I go here, I can reset this to default. And I can always toggle by hitting Command Z to see what it was before by undoing. So I can always reset this. And then I know that, okay, in my file, I need to change this to a secondary button. Or the same thing here with my uh, danger, delete everything. I can reset that. You know, it's still retaining my text override here. I can quickly change this back to danger. Um, and I, I have my icon here. It still knows that delete was there. 
So there is a little bit of updating um, afterwards, um, but that is just in general, a quick example to show uh, one way you could potentially expect um, these changes to um, roll out. Awesome, so with that, um, I'm going to um, turn it over here. We're gonna just have a quick little discussion um, with Jacob and Naomi on a couple of additional pieces on props. And then we're gonna dive into some Q and A. So um, just thinking about properties, you know, Naomi, you shared a little bit at the beginning about variants and component properties and you know, how props were really built upon variants. And just wondering if you could share you know, a little bit of the behind the scenes magic of, you know, how props came to be building upon that experience of variance. Yeah, for sure. Um, Component Props um, is actually a project that's been like a year long in the making. Um, so it's been very exciting to watch it launch. Um, I would say um, in general, it's one of the biggest changes we've made to components and instances since variance. Um, variance was kind of built in a way that's like a wrapper around like the existing components. Um, but with component properties, we really changed the way that sort of you can define like the actual component um, and how instances are going to sort of resolve their values. Um, so yeah, that was pretty exciting. And we had a few main goals in mind, a lot of which we um, sort of discussed in the introduction, um, but we wanted to bring components closer to code and really um, enable better handoff like we saw in the demo. We wanted to reduce what we call variant explosion where variants were getting super large um, because we, we did want to tackle some of the problems that users have been talking about with um, memory and file performance with these really large variant sets. Um, and then lastly, we also really wanted to sort of um, simplify some of the ways that we override components and override instances. Um, I think previously it's like a little bit, um, you know, not as well documented, like not as self-documenting as to like what you can change about an instance and by sort of having these properties at the top level, you're really able to know what you should be changing about a component. Um, and this also sort of helps us with um, transferring properties when you're performing instance swaps, for example. Um, one of the other things that I've worked on at Figma is the override transfer where we try to match different layers by name. Um, and so having properties um, sort of adds more predictability in terms of like what is exactly is going to be transferred when you're doing the swaps. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that we were thinking about when building this feature. Awesome. And Jacob, you know, I know that you were really, really close, you know, obviously from the PM side and, you know, working with the design side as well. You know, anything that you would add to it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's very interesting since I was coming over to Figma as a design system manager previously. So I experienced a lot of the pain of dealing with those huge variant explosions that were there. Um, and for me, like, you know, I was coming in, we had a component set that I think was like two or 300 variants. And I was like, oh man, this thing is crazy. It's huge. And I was blown away when I actually got to Figma to see some of the actual data under the hood around how big some of these variant sets can actually get. Uh, seriously, I think our record number, uh, record breaking variant set that's out there is something like 16,000 variants. And it is actually pretty common that I see variant sets with over a thousand instances that are there, which is just, it blows my mind that design system managers do that work to really like make it consumable by those users. So clearly there was a major problem there and we needed to solve that. And really, Boolean props uh, really, really help with that. They drastically cut down that variant explosion, as Naomi was talking about. And that was something we really wanted to focus on. In addition to that, we really wanted to focus on making sure that uh, those memory issues that came about with those huge variant explosions uh, were hopefully addressed as well. And so hopefully with component props, things are a little bit lighter when you're actually implementing and bringing these libraries into your files. So those are a lot of the things that we were thinking about and considering, uh, especially from the product sense, is just like, hey, how can we make this more usable and more sustainable for uh, design system managers as well? Yeah, and something you said there, Jacob, you know, I know I've also experienced this on, you know, I know previously it was like, oh, we had a component set that was maybe around, you know, most complex was like 300 some, and then it's like, whoa. Um, but, you know, just kind of going upon that and just thinking about the couple of weeks it's been since config, you know, how we've already seen folks really start to use this and see those reductions in their libraries. Um, you know, we saw this even in some of the beta side of things. And, you know, I wonder if you could just share a little bit of um, some of the key learnings and what we've seen um, since the release of component properties at config. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously we've seen a lot of people going in and doing those large reduction of variant sets, uh, which is awesome. It's so cool to see those on Twitter, people posting things like, oh, I reduced it this much, it's awesome. Um, but there's a lot of other things that we've seen as well uh, that really kind of blew this away and made us really think about, oh, right, there's more to this feature than, than we would actually normally think. Um, some of the things that were there, and you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is alignment with code. Uh, people are very excited, obviously, to have components that more represent the code version of their components that are out there because it really helps with that dev handoff. When you have properties on your actual Figma components that line up one-to-one -one with what you have in React, like that's a dream because if you hand it to your developer, they just inspect that component like, oh yeah, here's the attributes I need, cool, boom, we've got that, we can implement it. Um, so that part was really cool to see and you know, it was surprising seeing how much effort teams really put into actually doing that as well. The other thing we were really considering and something that really kind of came out about this is that um, it's not necessarily about making that authoring experience better or that consumption experience better. Um, I mean, obviously those are things that we were really thinking about here, but in the end, it's really giving the design system managers the control to make those consumption experiences the best that they can. And that's really like the root of what this was is enabling them to feel like they had the power to actually do what it was that they wanted with these components. Awesome. Now, also thinking about as teams are starting to use this, you know, I know I've seen uh, some of the chat going and some of the questions uh, with like refactoring those existing sets, right? Um, even as I kind of mentioned, right? Like, you know, you get major code framework updates or major changes on code, like those can be breaking changes that um, developers then work through. Um, you know, this being a pretty large update in Figma, um, as I mentioned, sometimes depending on how your libraries are structured, um, it could be more of a breaking change for one place than it could be for another. So, um, you know, one thing that I think personally is that, you know, having a migration and update plan in place is you know, really, really important, kind of that could and should, like, you know, what things should you do? Um, but really just with all major updates, you should really have that, right? Um, but thinking about, you know, even our own Figma libraries and some of them that we've seen from customers, you know, Naomi, Jacob, you know, I know we've all looked at many, many things, but, you know, curious, what are some things that are top of mind for you that teams should be thinking about and planning for as they start to migrate over to using props with existing libraries? Yeah, I'll feel that. Um, Chad, I think you brought up a really good point and you touched upon something really important there which is that when you're looking at engineering teams that are out there, they have a migration plan because the amount of complexity that's inside of code. Um, there's no perfect process for migrating code. So you have to do a lot of testing. You have to make sure that those changes aren't breaking uh, before you roll those out. And if they are breaking, you have to create a plan for it. As Figma gets more complex, there's times where the magic won't work perfectly when transferring those things over. I mean, we're talking about essentially creating an API for use for these really rich uh, logic-driven components that are out there. And if you're doing big breaking changes where you're moving from like a base component architecture to a non-base component architecture, or you're changing some like variant property from things like icon before, icon after, icon none, to two separate like Boolean properties that are there to control that visibility, those are gonna be breaking changes. And so you really need to go and test these actual updates before you push these out to all of your users. You have to treat your design system the same way that engineers treat their design system at some point. Um, it is a lot of complexity that's there, but you know, there's a trade-off of giving that power and control to those DS authors to create the best consumption experience possible. But once you add that complexity that's there, it kind of comes with that you know, responsibility. It's that whole with great power comes great responsibility thing. Um, it comes with the responsibility of making sure that those changes aren't gonna be breaking for your users. So what I definitely recommend there is uh, for org tiers and above, um, you can definitely do branching for these and use branches to test these changes. Otherwise, what I'd recommend is test to see if that update process works on some of your own kind of local files that are there. And if it doesn't, then duplicate that out and publish as a new version of that library. That way you're not breaking those changes and when you know, your designers hit that update button, they aren't kind of overriding uh, their existing work that's there. Awesome. Um, and kind of real quick before my last question, I just want to expand one thing you touched on in there. And I, I know this is a hot take, it's a hot question, but you know, 
you mentioned base components and, you know, a lot of times base components were created to make it very easy to update multiple variants in a file, you know, but with some of the on canvas multi-selection tools now, just, you know, being able to drag, you know, doing pasting into multiple things, you know, personally, I found less and less need for base components as an, as an author. Um, but just for folks out there, you know, what would you recommend if you want to move away from base components or if you want to continue using them? And I might be leading into some future thinking here, maybe, maybe not. Absolutely. Um, so base components obviously provide you with a lot of power to reduce the variant sets that are out there. And that's really one of the main reasons why people use them is it allows for um, ease and maintainability while reducing those variant sets. And that was true, I think, in the world previously. Um, now with properties that are there, as well as a lot of the multi-select controls that we have, I don't think there is necessary to really like enable a great um, maintenance experience in your design system components. So I would say this, if you are building from scratch today, don't do base components. I don't think you need them. And hey, if you encounter a situation where you do need them, it's easy enough to add them in. If you have a system that has base components today, what I would say is do one of two things. Either create a duplicate of your library and publish a V2 without those base components. That said, I don't think that's really needed right now. And the reason why I don't think it's needed is this. We're going to be working on a feature called bubbled properties, which will allow you to bubble the properties from that base component to the parent component and allow you to control all those properties from the parent component directly. That will really heavily improve, uh, improve that base component experience. And so I don't think you need to refactor away from them. Hold tight for now. It's something we're going to be working on and we'll be pushing that out as well as a few other things in the future, which will be fun. Awesome. Speaking of last question before we go over to Q&A, um, other things coming in the future, Naomi, anything that you could chime in on there? Can we give folks a little preview of maybe what's on the roadmap or in yeah, the Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so in addition to base uh, bubbled properties, excuse me, uh, which will also help for variant variants that are nested inside of your components, we'll also be bubbling variant properties as well. Um, we are planning on implementing suggested values, um, which will help consumers have an idea of what um, instances they should be using with their instance swap properties. So perhaps you want to sort of like limit or suggest specific um, icons that you want to be used in that instance swap property. Um, suggested values will sort of help um, guide your consumers of that component. Um, so that's another thing that will be coming soon. Um, and then we also have a few quality of life things. Um, we are actively listening to a lot of the feedback that we've been getting through support forums um, and stuff like that. So we're listening to that pretty actively. Um, and last but not least, we're also working on making changes to the plugin API to support both reading and writing component properties. So um, folks who use the plugin API and want to be able to do some more automated um, sort of manipulation of component props will be able to do that as well. Awesome. So with that, thank you. I want to uh, switch it over here to uh, some Q&A so um, we can uh, put us all in the hot seat here and let's uh, take a look at the Q&A. Um, we've been gathering some questions from in the Q&A uh, behind the scenes and uh, let's just dive right in and uh, answer some questions that folks have. All right. Oh, all right, so yeah, I'm all here. Let's, uh, let's just jump in here instead. All right, I'm going to zoom in here. All right, so um, first question, does that mean we can import component properties directly into React? Jacob, Naomi, any thoughts on this um, kind of like probably future with API support potentially? Yeah, I think it really depends on how your design system is set up, um, as well as how your code base is set up. Um, you probably won't be able to directly import um, because we, um, I guess, yeah, like you would need to hook up like your React components to sort of functional logic besides just having like your properties set up. Um, but 
um, our inspect panel does have like a copy paste functionality to so be able to paste over different properties that are sort of set on the instances that you're using. So you might be able to sort of like bring that over to your React components in your code base. Um, and it, in addition, like what Chad was saying with the plugin API, you'd probably also be able to sort of like um, programmatically take um, the component properties that are set on your instances and um, port them over to your code base. Oh, more more questions on the plugin API. So, do we do we know any uh, any timeline on when that may be updated? Anything we um, can say? I will say that it's being worked on right now. So soon um, is the answer. And um, for those of you that are not in the plugin developer Slack uh, workspace, I would definitely recommend joining that because we'll be posting all updates um, to when the plugin API is um, releasing new versions. Oh, all right. I am jumping all around in my file here. <laughs> all right. Um, so I have a button component with an icon and the button has multiple states that should change the color of the icon. But when I swap instance of the icon, the color doesn't change. I can Jacob, probably I handle wonder. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is actually an interesting thing that we see a lot of times here um, when you're actually swapping out icons. And I think this was true, not just with uh, component properties, but in the past as well. Um, Oftentimes, when you're doing these swaps of icons that are there, we're able to transfer those colors directly over if the layer architecture is the same and if the layer naming is the same. So what I'd heavily recommend you do with all of your icons is flatten those vectors to a single layer and make sure that the name of that single layer inside of that icon is the same across your entire icon set. Yeah, exactly. So as Chad is uh, showing here, for each of them, they have a single layer that's there that's named icon. And if you have that, then those colors can transfer over because it knows, hey, I swapped from a instance that had an icon layer with that was vector data to another icon that had a layer that was named icon with vector data. And so I can transfer that easily. Yeah, so this really goes into, yeah, when it's used in the component, name it, you know, the same thing in the component. So, you know, we have it as image here. And then, of course, that icon is uh, flattened and just named icon. Awesome. So let's see here. Um, ah, more on buttons. So for button example, if you later need to adjust spacing between text and icons, you need to unhide all the layers before making tweaks. Um, it gets complicated to do this for complex components. Do you have any tips on making it easier? Um, you know, one of the things that I will usually recommend for doing something like this in a library, um, I'm going to come right back in here. Um, so I, I was kind of showing there where I was already going and setting the um, icon boolean back to true there. But what I could do if I want to make changes, um, if I just hold down Option on a Mac or um, Alt on Windows, I can just drag out one example. And then here in the file, I can go ahead and just turn those on. And then as I'm making my update to the component here, I can adjust my spacing and start to see I have an example of what that's going to look like without needing to go unhide everything or manipulate everything um, within my library. Cool. So will we be able to independently order properties and variants intermingled in the sidebar soon? Ooh, this is a great question. This is actually a question that uh, is great. I have, I have the same question. So I, I wonder, this is probably more directed for Jacob or Naomi. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I can handle this one. So right now, um, it's a lower priority item for us at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of other improvements that we want to get to first, such as bubbled props, suggested values. Um, before we allow for that intermingling that's there. Um, if it is a continued thing that people are, hey, we really need to do this um, after we've launched those other features, then it's definitely something that we'll try and roadmap and get that out there. Awesome. Cool. For swap instances, is there a way to swap instances that are of different sizes without changing the proportions? Do they have to be the same size? Yeah, this is something I can answer. Um, today, unfortunately, when you use the instance swap property, 
the instance will uh, be the same size as the original nested instance that you have there. Um, but we are aware of you know folks wanting to be able to swap instances so that they are like different sizes. And so I believe this is on our roadmap. Um, and so it's something that we are also looking to enable soon. Awesome. Uh, when you have booleans inside a frame with auto layout set to hug contents and turn on and turn all booleans off, the auto layout frame expands as though they're all turned on. Would love to hear your thoughts on this. Hmm. That seems strange to me. Um, see, I'm turn all the balloons off and it expands as if they're all turned on. Alex, that sounds like a bug to me more than a feature. Uh, could you file a ticket with that? Yeah, that would that'd be, definitely be helpful uh, to file a ticket on that. And um, Jacob, we can also follow up on that as well. Yeah, totally. Cool. Um, I saw there was one other question in the chat here real quick too. Oh no, it might've moved on me. There was one question I saw in the corner of my eye that I wanted to, uh, to bring up at the end here. And I am not seeing it now. I'm so, so sorry. It was asked by Brad and I'm not seeing it now. All right. Well, uh, apologies that I, I can't see. Oh, actually someone asked right here. We're in the community. All right, so what I'm going to do here, so I will just close this out here. Um, oh, there's the question. Uh, has the thought been put into allowing a fill to be changed as a prop so that states could be changed via prop, like selected, et cetera, um, like kind of like a color fill prop? Has that been anything we've possibly considered? Yeah, uh, I can feel that one. Um, we definitely looked at this early on. Uh, it was eventually kind of cut from scope. Um, one of the things that we really discovered with things like kind of fills that are out there is that hover effects oftentimes change multiple things within the file, within the actual component. So if you're hovering over like a button, you may increase not only the background, but also the uh, contrast of the text as well. And so because of that, we do find that variants are still better for hover effects. Um, as well as like things like active or selected states where you may also include like a border around that. So what I'd recommend for those things right now, like hover states is use a mix of variants and component properties to actually support that. Awesome. So kind of closing this out today, you know, first and foremost, thank you so, so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, there are a couple of resources. Um, you know, we've had uh, Sula and Alyssa behind the scenes who are really helping with uh, sharing links and everything in the chat. Um, they will paste these links into the chat as well. There we go, Sula already added it, perfect. Um, but definitely check out the community file, uh, playground file on getting started with component properties. Um, also help center documentation there. Um, of course, we will continue to have more information coming out about component props. Um, and with that also, you know, if you are having questions, you want to engage more with the Figma community or share your thoughts and ideas, um, a couple of really helpful links here, help.figma.com, um, friends.figma.com, and forum.figma.com, all great resources for you. And last but certainly not least, um, yes, the session, it was recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel, um, likely some point next week. Um, also, we have lots of live streams that we do. Um, check out figma.com slash events for all of our future live streams. And if you have ideas for things you'd love to see in a live stream, um, send us a message, let us know about them. Uh, message community at figma.com and share your ideas with us. So with that, I wanna say once again, thank you. Jacob, Naomi, thank you so much for uh, being a part of the live stream today as well and sharing all of your knowledge with the community. It is so greatly appreciated. Absolutely. And hey, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to share all these things today and feel free to reach out to us, share us feedback, file those bugs um, and look forward to more of these office hours in the future. <laughs>